Amen. Love that song, but I love the truth behind it, glorious love. And speaking of love, I was glad to have Alex and Renee here, newly married. I think this is your first Sunday here, though Renee was serving, and Alex was serving Wednesday night with the SOS. Glad to have them there. And Lisa and John up in the balcony, they got married this past weekend, so praise the Lord for their and church is ready. Talking about love around here, love is in the air at First Baptist Church. Quite a bit of weddings this summer. And I'm looking forward to that as, as we have reason to rejoice when two Christians join in a covenant marriage, covenant relationship before God. What a blessing, what a blessed thing that is for us at First Baptist Church. And I'm excited for that. Some of you along the way are going to complain about going to weddings. Now listen here, folks. Listen here. This is good when two Christians get married. The one thing... The one thing that Jesus Christ said, that God said, would be an example, a picture of his relationship with the church is marriage. The one that he didn't say it was how big your Bible is, or how short your hair is, how long your skirt. Those are good things. I'm not saying they're bad things. But he said the one picture, all right, that I'll show uh, the world of what my relationship with the church looks like between Jesus Christ and the church is marriage. And we have a number, I think eight or nine or 400 weddings this summer. I don't know, something like that. I guess if you're thinking about getting married, uh, I guess it's a thing to do this year, right? And uh, I guess don't drink the water or whatever's going on. I don't know what it is, folks, but I'm excited for all that, excited for these, for these couples, excited for, for uh, uh, Alex and Renee and then John and Lisa up there. If you have your Bibles open to Colossians chapter 1 tonight, Colossians chapter 1. I'm glad you're here. Thanks for coming tonight. And uh, boy, you're singing well tonight. Lord gave us a good service so far. And just enjoyed hearing the congregation sing those songs together. That song, Love Lifted Me, man, what a powerful, powerful truth, but you sang it well. And I think one, one benefit of our time, a little brief time apart through the, COVID night, through the COVID pandemic, was that when we've come back together, our singing has been so much better. So much better. And I believe it's because you come to church on purpose, intentionally. You're here to sing, here to worship God. We're praying that God meets with us in every single service. I'm asking that God use me in each service, praying before the service tonight, that God would use the things I've studied. Listen, I can do my part, but it doesn't matter a lick if God doesn't show up here tonight. And I want him to show up in the song service, in, in every single part. I want him to be evident and him to be uplifted. I want our hearts to be touched, turned toward him. I don't want these services ever to be just, uh, just a check-off-the-list waste of time. All right, God has to meet with us here. And when he does, that's important. All right, that's important, that's special. To think that God of the universe, his son Jesus Christ, would meet with us at, at a building like this. He would come down and meet with us. But the Bible says he will. He will. And we can meet with him and worship with him. And the Bible even says that the Father seeks such. He's looking for those who will worship him correctly. All right, the Bible says to worship him and then in spirit and in truth. So worship him, but worship him correctly. And we try to do that here at First Baptist Church. We're not perfect. You know that. I know that. But we're trying to meet with God and him meet with us in these services. Tonight we're in Colossians. Of course, if you've been to any of these series yet, you know that the point of, the, of Colossians is Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ. That's the point. And really, Christian, that's the point of life. Jesus Christ. That in all things, Colossians 1, I believe it's verse 21, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Actually, verse 18, in all things he might have the preeminence. The point of life is Jesus Christ. If that's not the point of your life, then you've got the wrong point in life. You have a faulty point. Your life will not succeed truly in God's economy. The point of life is that in all things, everything we do, not just at church, but at home, at work, everywhere we go, in hobbies and play and vacation and work, all those things, and at home and marriage and family, all those things, and, and in all things, he might have the preeminence. The very first place. Paul has been telling the church of Colossae, listen, your problem is a Jesus problem. Your problem is that you've got all, 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 all tossed around over here, and you're over here, and you're, you're thinking about this, you're looking at this, and you're missing the point of life. It's Jesus Christ. Last week, we looked at the idea in verse number 22, how the Lord Jesus Christ is going to present us in his body of his flesh through death to present you, that is us as Christians, holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. And last week we looked at what that looks like, what Jesus wants to do with his chosen vessels, us as Christians. He's making a presentation to God, and it's us. And we're going to be approved in his sight, whether it's God or Jesus, it's the same thing. They're both God. But tonight, 
verse 23, the Bible lays out for us some pretty clear ideas about ways that we can thwart, that we can hinder what Jesus Christ wants to do. I mentioned it briefly last week, don't hinder the process. And prelude to this particular idea found in verse 23, what it looks like when you hinder the process of Jesus Christ. He's trying to do something. And he's doing something, if you'll let him, that is beautiful and magnificent and special and unique. And some of us stand in the way. Verse 23, the Bible says this, if ye continue in the faith, Grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which, we, which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Lord, I thank you for this time. Lord, I pray that you'd help me. Lord, as I try to speak your words tonight, Lord, I need your spirit to give me the words in the right order, in the right way, Lord, that would be clear and helpful. Lord, I'm asking that your spirit would touch hearts tonight, that your word would convict and correct. And Lord, I pray that you touch us tonight. Lord, you've given us a good service so far. But Lord, we, as we look at your word, we want to be touched by your spirit and by your word. Lord, help us. Lord, help us not to hinder what you're trying to do in our life. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Thwarted. Back in February, there was a man in North Carolina... He was arrested. He was arrested after he tried, to, he tried to do three different crimes in the space of just a few hours, and in each situation, he was, there's the word, help me here, thwarted. He tried, first of all, to carjack a man in a car at an intersection. He walked up to the man, opened the man's door, he was unarmed, and he said, get out of your car. And the driver said, no, shut the door and drove away. <laughs> not to be deterred, apparently, not to be deterred, he proceeded down the road a little ways in North Carolina. I don't know why North Carolina, just where it happened, all right? I'm not saying anything about people in North Carolina. Just where the story, where, where, the, where the news article took, took place. He comes across a lady in a car. And apparently, as the article that I read, he climbs into her passenger seat because her car was unlocked and attempted to carjack her but ran away once she called the police <laughs> not to be stopped not to be stopped he then proceeded to go to a house and break into the house he took a brick as the news article went and threw it through the window and climbed in through the window and came upon the home resident who happened to be armed. He fled. And the police picked him up a few, a few uh, uh, yards or a, few, a half a mile or so away from that house. Titled or, or given the, 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 the moniker perhaps the most unlucky criminal. How embarrassing would it be? You go to jail, right? What are you here for? Nothing. What, what did you do? Nothing. What, what you do? I was trying to carjack this one guy, this one lady, and rob a house. I'm a, you, can't, you can't even commit a crime. What's wrong with you, dude? Thwarted. I brought with me tonight, to help us tonight, a $100 bill. Now you're all awake right now. <laughs> if it's possible, could we get this on the screen, gentlemen, upstairs? It'll take them just a second because they will, they will have to work for it. $100 bill. This is, to my knowledge, all right, a genuine, a genuine $100 bill. I got it from a bank, and so if it's, you know, it's not, and, and I need, I'm going to need help tonight. Brenton already has, come here, Brenton, you're fine, come here. Had his hand already raised. When I looked down the audience, I thought Brenton will volunteer for this, I'm sure of it. You stand right here in the middle, buddy. Okay. Maybe you've seen this before, but I need to illustrate something. I want you to take your fingers like this, like a scissor, all right? Nope, up and down. <laughs> Can I have someone competent? <laughs> how, how old are you, Brenton? 14. 14, okay. No surprise. Maybe you've seen this before, but Brenton, if, Brenton, if you can catch this $100 bill between your fingers, I'm moving your hand, you can have it. 
Now, how many have seen this before? You know, it's, in, it's impossible for him to catch, right? Impossible, right? Do you want to see it again? You want to see if you can now? Hold it right there, okay. All you have to do, yep, yep, there we go. All you have to do is when I drop it, all right, close your fingers. <laughs> I know you're 14, but, man, you're still young. All right, you're vibrant. Maybe you work out some more, but it's okay. Did you get that real close? Brenton. <laughs> you think you're smart, don't you? You're not that smart. Yeah, you're not that smart, because I have another one in here, actually. Well, i got to catch you. No, Brenton, I can catch you. Maybe not right now, but I can catch him. Eventually, you have to sleep, boy. And, uh, now, we can do this all night long, can we not? The results will never change. Brenton will never catch this. This is physically impossible to catch a $100 bill. Your eyes and your reactions do not happen fast enough. Sometimes, when we approach this idea in Colossians chapter 1 about what Christ wants to do, we feel like we're trying to catch a $100 bill through our fingers. You with me? And no matter what we do, we're just grasping at the air. No matter how many times we come to church, no matter how many times we pray, no matter how many times we're just grasping at straws, we're grasping the air, and no matter what we do, we just quite, can't quite catch what Christ is trying to do. We'll always end up a little bit short. I want you to recognize something, that that is not what this passage is talking about tonight. Jesus Christ is not trying to trick you and to fool you and have you have a $100 bill that you almost... You try so hard. His fingers are shaking. Yeah. <laughs> now, you actually can have that one. Come back up here, though. I got another one in here. It went somewhere in here. It's in my Bible. I can't. Yeah, well, I'll find it. There it is. I brought two. Now, this is what happens, though, in real life. Put your hand out. Okay. Jesus Christ says, you have me. Right? He says, you have me. All we have to do is accept it. We're not like this. He says, you have, you have me. You have me. And then we think, well, you know what? Other Christians snatch Jesus away from me. You know, that person of the church, they were so mean to me. And all of a sudden, they've snatched Jesus out of my life. They didn't snatch Jesus out of your life. He's right there. Well, that pastor, he ignored me in the hallway. Right? That prayer request that I prayed a lot for, I felt that God didn't answer it the right way. Snatched away. But that's not what this verse is giving as well. You know what this verse is showing us? That Jesus says, you're right there. And what do we do? Watch. This is what we do. It's not him. It's us. He says, I'm doing something. I'm going to present you a certain way before my father. It's going to be good. You're going to be holy, unblameable, unreprovable in his sight. And we say, I don't think so. So tonight, thanks. And you keep that one, by the way. So tonight, can we look at this idea of being forwarded tonight? In this passage, there are three ways that we thwart, if we don't do what Jesus says, that we thwart the process of what Christ wants to do. Three ways. Now notice, well, before the three ways, notice that in verse 23 says this, if ye continue... There's the condition to continue. The Bible is telling us, first of all, that in order not to be thwarted, we must continue. There is a responsibility that falls onto you and onto me. This does not automatically happen. This is a conditional response. Or to say it this way, to continue or not to continue, that is the question. 
And Christian, my friend, brother, sister, mom, dad, husband, wife, you get the choice whether to continue with what Jesus Christ has done in your life or to thwart the process. Not everyone will continue. What this looks like is Christians who are saved, but they tend to move away from a vibrant walk and relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe you've met someone, maybe you've been in this spot before when what you used to be excited about doesn't excite you anymore. You can use the word backslidden a little bit, right? They use that word. Apathetic, perhaps. We know that you're not continuing in Jesus Christ. Concepts that seemed to used to be important before are not so important any longer. Things that were a priority before now play second fiddle in your life to continue with Jesus Christ. You see, not everyone will continue, but everyone can continue. This particular concept is for everybody, whether you're four or five or 44 or 45 or 84 or 85. This is not just for the young person. It is not just for the middle-aged mom. It is not just for the old grandparent. It is for every single person, but not everyone will continue. Unfortunately, and the Bible even speaks of that, where Paul says that Demas, he hath forsaken me. He didn't continue. And, and though we all can, not everyone will. You see, what is asked is not too hard. This is not some idea when we look at the concepts of how we're supposed to continue. It is not something so high and so vast and so far that we have no chance. You're going to realize in a moment that it's fairly simple. That it's what a normal Christian is supposed to do. Just continue. You see, our salvation is not dependent on us continuing, but our sanctification is. Our salvation is dependent upon Jesus Christ. He saved us. He holds us. He keeps us. Salvation is by grace. It's all of Jesus Christ. I only respond to it. I don't hold on to my salvation. God holds on to me in salvation. But sanctification, how I grow as a Christian, depends upon my obedience. If I respond to Jesus Christ or not. Salvation is a gift. It's a response of faith. Sanctification is also a gift. It's a response of obedience. We have a tremendous gift well worth well more than a hundred measly dollars. But most of us here tonight wouldn't mind an extra hundred dollars. And Jesus Christ has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, the riches that are unmeasured. Maybe you've read about lottery winners who have won vast sums of money and end up worse off when it's all said and done. In fact, they say the majority of lottery winners end up in a worse place because of terrible spending, because of bad habits before, they end up in the exact same spot buying more lottery tickets to get back what they used to have. There were, though, a few that didn't end up in the same spot. Family, lady and her children won the lottery a few years back. They decide to just invest their money and give most of it away. And that's what they have done. They are still, because of their investment, still very wealthy. But they've helped countless students go to school. Kids go to college. And they're still in a similar or a better spot than when they won the lottery. Another man won the lottery, and he gave every bit of his money away to cancer research. $40 million plus dollars. His life didn't change at all. But we know, we've heard the stories, countless stories, the ones who've wasted it. I know Christians who have been given the gift of eternal life and the wonderful gift of salvation, the chance for sanctification, and they've ended up, it seems, in a worst bankrupt spot of life. They've been given an opportunity to really please Jesus and live for him, and now, years later, you look back and say, wow, it was almost like it was a waste. What's the difference? It's on you and me on you and me. Tonight from this verse, three, three ways to make sure we don't thwart what God wants to do in our life. Look in that verse, if you would, he begins to say this, if you continue in the faith, 
grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. The first idea is this, the first concept of this, in order to make sure that we're not thwarting what God wants to do, we must be, first of all, fixed on the foundation. Fixed on the foundation. Taking notes, write that down. Fixed on the foundation. We are saved because of Jesus Christ. He is the foundation. Jesus says it this way. There are two men. They built their house. One built on rock. One built on sand. When the storms of life came, the one on rock withstood. And the one on sand, Jesus didn't say this, but, but the song says it went splat. Help me here. Young people, you know the song. When the rains came, the house in the sand went splat. Jesus is the only true foundation. Can I get an amen? What this verse says, he said, make sure that you will continue in Jesus Christ if, if you continue and you're grounded. That word grounded is foundation. If your foundation is set. You say, well, pastor, what's the idea? Here's the idea. Jesus Christ is the solid foundation, all right? We cannot add to him. We cannot take away from Jesus Christ. No matter what we do, we'll change his foundational characteristics. He is truth. I am the way, the truth and the life. He is the right foundation. What he says is true. What he does is true. What he gives to us is truth. He's the right foundation, and you cannot change that fact. Accept it or reject it, believe it or disbelieve it, he still is the only true foundation. But our part is to be firmly and fixed on that foundation. Or, men, to make sure you've got some straps attached to the foundation of Jesus Christ. Now, once we're saved, he is our foundation for heaven. Never be changed. But in life, if we're not fixed on him, we will be tossed to and fro, back and forth. When we're tossed back and forth and moved around all over the place, guess where we're not? We're not fixed on the foundation. When we're not fixed on the foundation, then we are thwarting the process of what Jesus Christ is trying to do. You say, okay, pastor, I get it. What do I do? I'm glad you asked. So picture this. Jesus Christ is the foundation. And I'm doing my dead level best in my life to make sure that I keep on attaching myself to Jesus Christ. How do we do that? Simple, really. Every time I read God's word, guess what I do? Get it? So if you don't read your Bible every day, guess what you're missing? You're missing out on attaching your foundation. You're still going to heaven. You can still survive life. But you spend time with God to fix yourself to that foundation. How many times have you been in God's word? I know I've been many times. And what God gave me for that day was just what I needed for that day. If I hadn't been in the Word, I would have been tossed back and forth. I still would have been attached to Jesus Christ. But I wouldn't have had the foundation as fixed as it was. Every day, I fix it. I'm on there. You know why? One reason why we go to church? Fix the foundation. Listen, you can be a Christian, go to heaven, and never come to church. Never come to church. You can be a Christian, go to heaven, and only come to church once a year on Easter or twice, Easter and Christmas. You know what happens at church, though? Your foundation gets settled, gets fixed. Happens in the songs. You're singing, man, love lifted me. That's right. Man, praise the Lord for that. Or they're singing a song, and you're like, man, this morning, Brother Brady's saying, right? Trust his heart. Boy, that's right, Lord, I needed that today because, you know, I had this situation. Your, your foundation's being fixed. You see a fellow Christian, and they say, hey, good to see you at church today, praying for you. Oh, your faith is strengthened. You're fixed. You hear preaching from the word of God. You respond to it. Guess what happens? You're fixed. You're fixed. You see, our responsibility is to make sure that we're grounded, we're fixed to that foundation. Now, he will never let us go, but in life, we can be tossed to and fro. We get grounded when we get in God's word. We get in God's place. And we obey God's word. 
You know what happens when you obey God's word? You find out again that it's true. You read the verse, you know it to be true, and you read, boy, a soft answer turneth away wrath. We know that verse. We know that when someone irritates us, we should answer kindly, not in kind, but kindly. And sure enough, someone is just ripping and roaring, and you happen to remember the verse from God's word, and you apply it, you obey it, and you find out it's true. You know what happens right then? Your foundation gets tied on. That's right. What God says is true. You hear about your finances and giving to God, and you obey obey it. And God blesses you, and you find out, you know what? God's word is true. You find out about prayer, and you pray, and you see God answer prayer, and that foundation gets fixed. Listen, folks, we're supposed to be fixed on the foundation. Fixed on the foundation. How are you at being fixed on the foundation? You see, it seems that some people are content with a few bungee cords. This ought to hold us just fine, family. Listen, dads, and you wonder why life is going all over the place. You wonder why life is a mess and a turmoil. You know why? Because you just got some bungee cords running there. Then you meet a Christian who seems to have those semi-truck straps and chains. You're like, wow, they went through that tragedy, and they're still rejoicing. You know why? Because they're fixed. You want to thwart what God wants to do, then just don't bother to fix your foundation or fix yourself to the foundation. Just live life like you want to and handle it, and when it suits well, throw a strap over. What will happen is you will thwart, you will hinder what Jesus Christ wants to do in your life. Number two, tied closely to it. He says grounded, and he says settled. Number two, we're supposed to be fixing the foundation. We're supposed to be firm in the faith. Firm in the faith. Closely connected to being fixed on my foundation, firm in the faith is actually acting upon what Jesus Christ has said to do. Too many Christians, too many people, are content with past faith, and ignoring present faith. I got saved back here. I saw an answer to prayer back here. I saw God work back here. But now we're just living life this way. What is Jesus Christ doing in your life presently? Christians sometimes are content with having exercised 30 years previously. And depending upon that if I can, treadmill time from 30 years before to carry them through this particular trial. The Bible says we're to be grounded and settled. That word settled has the idea of being steadfast. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Well, I don't know. Is it this or is it this, this or this? Firm in the faith. If God has said it, I believe it. And if God said it, I will do it. How quick do you respond to God? How quick? When God speaks to you, do you follow what he says? How about when God touches your heart in service? Do you respond? When God says, listen, you should give a testimony. Oh, sweat breaks out. Hands begin to shake. How quick do you respond to what God says? My friend, we're supposed to be firm in the faith. A wishy-washy Christian is just a half-baked, disgusting, unattractive witness. But a firm Christian is an attractive ambassador for Jesus Christ. Faith in my money. Faith with my fears. Faith with my worries. For some, it's not the physical things, it's up here, the the non-physical things, things we can't touch, where we have no faith, we're not firm in our faith. Listen, the Bible speaks, the Bible talks about what our attitude, what our thoughts ought to be. He says, be firm in the faith. You see, our future is dependent upon our obedience. Supposed to be fixed on the foundation, 
firm in our faith. And number three, we're supposed to be focused on the future hope. Look at the verse, if you would, please. The Bible says, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. When you and I were saved, hope moved in. When you and I, I were saved, hope became a reality. Here in Colossians, Paul is specifically referring to false teaching. Colossians written to the church of Colossae, and they've been dealing with some ideas, and false ideas had slid into the church. And Paul is again reminding them, do not be allured away by false teaching. Make sure that your focus is on the future hope. One night a man at dinner had spent many summers in a small town named Flagstaff. The town was to be flooded as part of a large lake for which a dam was to be built. The months before it was to be flooded, as the story goes, all improvements and repairs in the whole town were stopped. They figured, why repair anything that was to be wiped out? So week by week, the whole town became more bedraggled and more gone to seed, more deterioration. And he said this, where there is no hope in the future, there is no power in the present. When we focus on the future, we realize that Jesus Christ is doing something. And I'm going to stand before him one day. Maybe you've seen this little meme on social media where they'll say to parents, there is a 99.99 whatever percent chance that your child will play professional sports. But there is a 100% chance that they will stand before Jesus Christ. The hope of the future of the gospel is I get to stand and live with Jesus Christ forever and forever and forever. And because of that future, that affects the present. So I'm firm on my foundation, or fixed on my foundation. I'm firm in my faith, but I'm focused on the future, what Jesus Christ is going to do one day. I get to stand before him. That future makes it so I live life like I'm supposed to today. I don't mind messing with electricity. I'd rather enjoy it. My wife does not enjoy me so much messing with it. She says things like, you're going to kill yourself one day. Listen, I'm living forever. I'll live as long as Jesus does, right? Maybe not here on earth, but I'll live forever. You ever have a loose electrical connection? Things spark. It makes an exciting moment in your life when things are sparking. But the thing that you're trying to do with electricity doesn't work well with a loose connection. The motor that's supposed to turn doesn't turn just right. All right? The car that's supposed to run and the negative terminal is loose, it just doesn't operate just quite right. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. It's not dependable. It's not your favorite. It's your house. You flip on the light switch and you hear the little buzz in the back of the box. A loose connection right there. You can see the spark through the, through the switch. Oh, this is neat. Look, kid, fireworks in June. The light sometimes works. My friend, what we're supposed to have is a tight connection to the source of power that is Jesus Christ. And tied in tightly. Fixed foundation, firm in my faith, focused on him. Remember, it comes back to Jesus Christ. Colossians is about Jesus Christ. But the minute that I get loosey-goosey over here with Jesus, the minute that I just say, listen, you know what? It's all right. I'll live life today like I, I want to. I'll put this idea aside. I'm not ignoring Jesus Christ. I'm just going to loosen up the connection a little bit. When that happens, we thwart and hinder what Jesus Christ wants to do. He has placed to every single person the ability, the $100 bill right there. 
And you can take it and say, wow, thank you, Jesus. Or dump it over. Are you thwarting the process? Are you hindering what Jesus Christ is trying to do? If you are, I'll make it easy for you. Stop it. Lash, tie down. Firm here, focused here. Let him do those things. Lord, thank you for loving us. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, you're a gracious God. You're a good God. Lord, I pray you'd help us to be honest tonight. If we've hindered you and hindered what you've tried to do in our life. One who would say, Pastor, would you pray for me? As you spoke, God spoke to me. And there's some areas in my life when I've been hindering, I've been thwarting what God wants to do. Maybe you've not been tying down to the foundation correctly. Maybe you've been wishy-washy. Maybe you've missed the focus of Jesus Christ. One who would say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I don't want to hinder this. I don't want to thwart what Jesus Christ wants to do in my life and my heart. Who would say, that's me, Pastor, pray for me? Just a moment, we'll stand to our feet. And my friend, I encourage you to respond to God. Respond to Him. Not to me. Not for the folks around you. Respond to Jesus Christ. He loves you so much. He wants to present you before the Father. Don't hinder it. Lord, bless this invitation. Lord, bless this time now. Lord, may we honor you. Lord, may we be honest before you. Lord, if you've dealt with us, may we respond to you the right way. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen.